Welcome to a special presentation given by Chuck Messler entitled Spiritual Warfare. I want to take something on a little different tonight. I hadn't planned on it, frankly. And yet, for lots of reasons, I think it'll be fruitful to explore a few passages, uh, some of which may be review for you, but at least one verse I think will be new to you because it's a verse that has been overlooked by commentators for almost 2,000 years. And it's absolutely flabbergasting to me to discover something that has been apparently overlooked by the, quote, experts. Um, Hal Lindsey and I uh, put together recently a, uh, a what, what, we, what, we, what goes to his readers. He, has, he publishes a magazine called uh, Countdown, and he has from time to time things he calls a special report that uh, is available to their readers. And, of course, because we worked on it together, it's available to my following also. Uh, it's basically oh, a 70-page report with about 183 footnotes. And its first intention was primarily to nail down the identity of Magog. If you study Ezekiel 38 and 39, it's a very, very important passage for several reasons. One reason is, is it is, it describes in vivid detail nuclear technology, nuclear warfare technology. And, uh, it's interesting because the weapons that are left over from the battle, it's there described, provide all the energy needs of Israel for seven years. And you say, well, why seven, you know, it's, why seven years? And one of the recent discoveries is that the plutonium bombs of the Soviet Union have a shelf life of, guess what? Seven years. So that's kind of interesting. The whole technology reason is one reason so many people know is equal 38, 39. The other reason it's important is because it marks the key to God's dealing again with Israel. God is, in effect, um, turned from Israel from Luke 19 on when Jesus said, now these things are hidden from thy sight, speaking to Israel, and they are hidden, as Paul tells us, until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. So there's a period of time here in which the church has been God's primary vehicle his, uh, to deal with the planet Earth. But the day is coming when the church is complete and God will once again deal with Israel. And the event that marks part of that transition is uh, when God intervenes on behalf of Israel when they are invaded by Magog and its allies. So the original purpose of this paper was to really remove any ambiguity about who Magog really is. Clearly, as 183 footnotes tediously show, is that there's no question about who the identity is. It's a very interesting group of people. We've talked about that, but that's not what I'm going to talk about tonight because incident to this research, we've also discovered something. I noticed something one evening and ran over to Hal's house. And that's in, I live in Big Bear and he's in Palos Verdes, just to give you a few. <laughs> I, I, I took the car, don't miss anything. Um, and we spent till 2 a.m. going through his Greek references to, to make sure we didn't misunderstand something. And it turns out we're right. There has been an oversight, and it's a very interesting one. So I'm going to include that. But let's start tonight by examining or reviewing. Uh, let's start with one of the spookier chapters in the Scripture. The book of Daniel has 12 chapters. The first six are historical. They're narrative from the time that he's deported as a teenager all the way through his rise to power in the Babylonian Empire and his subsequent rise to power in the Persian Empire. But at chapter 6, it ends what I might call the historical part of the book. Chapters 7 through 12 are a series of visions that occur during, at various times, during the first six chapters. In other words, the the, the, the last six are not chronological after the first six. They're, they're, they're sort of the narrative and then all the visions, or most of them. Now, the last two chapters, chapter 11 and 12, are a major vision. It's very important. But what I want to focus on briefly tonight as an introduction is chapter 10, because in chapter 10, we encounter some very bizarre hints about what reality really is all about. I mean, what's, what, what, re, what is real around us? And we don't see much of this particular kind of thing in Scripture. There's a couple of places that it's hinted at. Chapter 10 has some very provocative perspectives 
that I believe are important for you and I to be sensitive to today. But I'll get to that. Let's first of all see what the Scripture says. In chapter 10, Daniel, it opens by Daniel undertaking a fast. He wants to prepare himself spiritually. He undertakes a commitment of a fast. Not an absolute fast. In other words, he doesn't deny everything but water, say. But he does eliminate from his routine everything but some real basics. Let's look at chapter 10, verse 1. In the third year of Cyrus, the king of Persia, a thing was revealed unto Daniel, whose name was Belteshazzar. And again, don't be confused by that name. Belteshazzar is the Babylonian name that was assigned to Daniel. Don't confuse it with Belshazzar, which was the king that was subsequent to Nebuchadnezzar. Two different guys. And many casual reading would cause you to get them confused. Belteshazzar is only occasionally appears, and it's the alternate name for Daniel. Belshazzar is another guy that's history. We won't get into that here. Anyway, um, the thing was true, and the time appointed was long, and he understood the thing and had understandings of the vision. In those days, I, Daniel, was mourning three full weeks. I ate no pleasant bread, neither came flesh nor wine in my mouth, neither did I anoint myself at all, till three whole weeks were fulfilled. How long was his fast? Or 21 days. Fair enough? In the four and twentieth day of the first month, I was by the side of a great river, which is the Hittichel. And I lifted up mine eyes and looked, and behold, a certain man, clothed in linen, whose loins were girded with the fine gold of Uphaz. His body also was like the barrel, and his face like the appearance of lightning, and his eyes like the lamps of fire and his arms and his feet in color like to polished bronze, and his voice, uh, the voice of his words like the voice of a multitude. Now, as you read this description, and if you've done your homework in the Old Testament and also in the book of Revelation, these idioms strongly suggest that the messenger in view here is none other than Jesus himself. Most commentators, but not all, identify this messenger as an Old Testament appearance of Jesus Christ. There are some that disagree, and both sides have good arguments. It will turn out later in the narrative here that this person is encumbered until Michael comes to help him. And because of that, some commentators feel this can't be the Lord Jesus, because he wouldn't need Michael to give him an assistant. You find that's their logic. And it's hard to argue with, and yet... Uh, for our purposes tonight, it's not that material. When you're doing a careful study of the book of Daniel, you'll want to get in behind this, come to your own conclusions, and I think you'll probably lean to the idea that this is an Old Testament appearance of Jesus Christ, but it's not. In this case, it isn't essential to the thrust of the passage, if you follow me. So I don't want to, I'm, I'm, I don't want to get into that issue, particularly I have another place I want to go tonight in the time we have. But I want you to be aware of the fact that it's not a slam-dunk identity. It's something that good scholars do have some disagreements about. But in any case, the key part is in verse 7, I, I, Daniel, alone saw the vision. The men that were with me saw not the vision. See, this is a vision in any case. But a great quaking fell upon them so that they fled to hide themselves. Therefore I was left alone and saw this great vision, and there remained no strength in me, for my comeliness was turned into me uh, into corruption, and I retained no strength. And by the way, that's another subtle argument that this is the Lord. Because every place in the Scripture, whether it's Isaiah, one place or others elsewhere, when they're confronted with the throne of God, that's always the reaction. Not one of excitement, not one of exhilaration, but one of um, an acute awareness of their own corruption. In, short, in other words... Um, a consciousness of the gulf between holiness and our present situation. And this is very, it's this whole flavor that Daniel's experiencing here too, which is another argument that he's confronting with deity here. But he goes on, yet heard I the voice of his words, and yet I heard the voice of his words, and then was I in deep sleep on my face, and my face toward the ground, and behold, a hand touched me, which set me up upon my knees and on the palms of my hands. In other words, prior to that, he was really prostrate. And yet, at this point, he's on his hands and knees. And he said unto me, O Daniel, a man greatly beloved, understand the words that I speak unto thee, and stand upright, for unto thee am I now sent. And when he had spoken this word unto me, I stood trembling. 
He said to me, Fear not, Daniel, for from the first day that thou didst set thine heart to understand and to chasten thyself before thy God, thy words were heard, and I am come for thy words. Interesting. When was he dispatched? 21 days ago. How long had Daniel been fasting? For 21 days. The text doesn't say it explicitly, but what's strongly implied is that there's a link between Daniel's fasting and this messenger getting through to him. In fact, it gets, let's go on. He was held up, right, for 21 days. Verse 13 tells you why. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me one and twenty days. Now that's kind of interesting. See, are they twenty-one days in? In uh, yeah, I mean, I'm not going to quarrel time domain stuff here. But as far as Daniel's concerned, that interval, whatever it was, appeared to Daniel as twenty-one days, was an interval that was consumed by a warfare between this messenger trying to get through to Daniel and some demonic um, force that was adverse to that, here labeled the king of Persia. He doesn't mean Darius or Cyrus. He doesn't mean the physical human king of Persia. He's referring to an angelic, or a fallen angelic, if you will, or a demon, a, 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 an adverse, dark, supernatural agency, organization, that has a leader that was known as the king of Persia within the spiritual community. You follow me? Now, this is kind of interesting because the picture that we're getting from this from Daniel is that Daniel sets his heart on the Lord and fasts and prays. And when that happens, a messenger is sent, dispatched. But he can't get through. For 21 days, this demonic agency, whatever it is, is withholding him, withstanding him. Until what happens? But lo, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me. And I remain there with the kings of Persia. In other words, he's wrestling, fighting. There's warfare going on. And one of the reasons I want to get into this a little bit, several reasons, one of which is we glibly use the phrase spiritual warfare. We use that a lot in Christian circles, biblical circles. And we mean all kinds of things by that, some valid, some not valid. I mean, in terms of the application of the term. Spiritual warfare, we usually mean a testing of our faith. And it includes that. It includes lots of things. Much of that spiritual warfare terminology we use to color or uh, uh, connotate our struggles with ourselves, with our flesh, with the world, and indeed with the forces that are adverse to us. But in this case particularly, the term spiritual warfare takes on a crisper, sharper meaning. We're talking spiritual beings in conflict in combat. You all remember in the Old Testament, Elisha's servant, who was frightened because they were surrounded by the Syrian army. And the prophet was trying to take a nap. And the servant was panicked. I mean, they're all around us. And the prophet says, hey, Lord, show them. And his eyes were open, and he realized that around them, unseen, but then made visible to him, were many times the forces that were against them, but they were invisible. And the prophet knew that, so he was taking a nap. The servant, a little less mature, a little less informed, obviously, was panicked until his eyes were opened. How many of you, just to use another kind of example to show you where I'm getting at, how many of you use a software package called WordPerfect? Or, or I'll put it another way, an equivalent word processor. WordPerfect is a package that in which you type and, you, and, and what you see on the screen is what you want on the page, the letters, the periods, and all this stuff. What you don't want to get involved with are all the things behind the text, which says what font, what size, is it a hard carriage return or a, a soft carriage return. You discover as you get into word processing, there are thousands of things that the software takes care of that you really don't want to know about normally, unless you're doing something clever or cute or doing something. Then you need to know what's going on to help correct something. And there's a button you can push called Reveal Codes. And then on your screen in a different color come all these additional things 
that tell you what's really going on. You know what I'm talking about? See, that's our problem in life. We see just the end product. We see the physical world. What we sort of need to have is a button that says revealed codes. See, if we could push that, we could see around us. Well, maybe we don't want to, huh? <laughs> Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. We're going to move into some spiritual, some spooky areas here. But let me not lose sight of that as we go down this path. But anyway, so far we have Daniel fasting and praying. And we have this messenger sent. And for 21 days, he's engaged in, if I may use it as an idiom, hand-to-hand combat with adverse, powerful spiritual forces. How powerful are they? Enough to keep him from coming through for 21 days. Now, the enigma that I leave you with to think through, because I can't prove it from the text, you have to draw your own conclusions. Is there a linkage between Daniel's fasting and this guy's travels? My, my, my implied test question is, what would have happened if Daniel cut off his fast after, say, 19 days? Would this messenger have shown up? We don't know. In other words, but there's sort of the undertone here. We can't help but infer, I don't know if the text implies it or we infer it, but the point is, we get the impression that there's somehow a relationship with Daniel's commitment to seek the face of God. Exemplified not only by a prayer, but his commitment to a fast. If we are personally encumbered in our spiritual growth, if if we look around and see other people doing better than we are spiritually, if we read the scripture and find, gee, interesting things happened to these people back then, why doesn't it happen now? One of the interesting possibilities is that we're not serious enough. We shoot off a quick telegram and wash our hands and get on with it, right? Our most profound prayer time is when we're stuck in traffic for a while. Somehow that isn't exactly the way we see Jesus Christ, where he went up the mountain and spent all night in earnest prayer. You know, I wonder how many people in Los Angeles wouldn't pray as much if the traffic was more freely moving. I don't know. Anyway. Um, and maybe I'm just being self-incriminating here because I spend some of my best quiet time in the hour and a half it takes to go up to Big Bear. I love that time because the phone ain't ringing. I can turn it off, no one knows. And uh, But still, that's not the same thing as really seriously seeking the face of God. Now, don't run out and get on a deep fast without doing some homework. If you're interested in fasting, get a book or two on it. There's lots of inexpensive little paperbacks that will give you background on how to conduct a fast. And even two, three days, very harmless. If you have uh, any medical problems, you should consult your doctor. But a fast is not harmful if done properly, but it needs to be done properly. There's a way to get on it, and more importantly, a way to get off of it. And it's simple, but you need to know how to do that, and I'm not going to get that here tonight. If you're interested in that sort of thing, do your homework. The point is, though, Daniel was rewarded because he was serious about his relationship with God. And one of the things you and I need to be challenged for, all of us, is to deepen our commitment to grow in grace the knowledge of the Lord and Savior. By Bible, by intense Bible study, by serious devotion to Him, by lots of time in prayer, and perhaps from time to time, getting even a little more serious in terms of making a commitment, a private, secret, invisible commitment, but nevertheless a real commitment to Him. Okay, we're not through, we're just getting warmed up. Um, <clears throat> We got there to verse 13. Verse 14, Now I'm come to make thee understand what shall befall thy people in the latter days, for yet the vision is for many days. Now the vision he's talking about isn't in this chapter. It's coming. 11 and 12 are the vision he's talking about. This whole chapter 10 is a preamble, but it's a provocative one. Well, Daniel uh, is uh, overwhelmed by this. Again, he has his mouth touched, and it goes on here. I won't take it word, by, word for word all the way through. But let's pick it up about verse 19. And the, and the O man, greatly beloved, fear not! Peace be unto thee, be strong, yea, be strong. By the way, there it is again. You notice that men always have to be told twice? You notice that, girls? You see, you thought that was just your experience. God said, Abraham, Abraham. Eli, Eli. You think? Men always have to be told twice. 
So I thought you girls would like to carry that away as something from the evening. Okay. Be strong. Hey, be strong. And when he had spoken unto me, I was strengthened and said, let my Lord speak. Now, there's the word, my Lord. That's a, some people build on that and argue another corrob- corroborative argument. But anyway, for thou hast uh, strengthened me. Then said he, knowest thou why I come unto thee? And now I will return to fight with the prince of Persia. See, he's not through. He's got to get back. How does he get back? There isn't an express here. He's got to go there and do battle again. But that's not all. He says, when I am gone forth, lo, the prince of Greece shall come. But I will show thee that which is noted in the scripture of truth, and that there is none that holdeth with me in these things, but Michael, your prince. Michael is the prince of Israel. Michael is always in warfare. Michael is a, a combat warrior. We know that we... Uh, the only two angels we really know the name, other than Lucifer, who got in a lot of trouble. We have only two na- two angels that we really know the names of: Gabriel and Michael. Gabriel is always on a messianic mission, of announcement or somehow related to the Messiah. Uh, Michael is always a combat warrior on behalf of Israel. That's just something you notice as you go through the Scripture. That's always the way they're portrayed. But let's back up a minute. Here is this messenger, whoever he is, sent when Daniel starts to pray. It takes 21 days to get there. Talks to Daniel. He says, I'm going to give you two chapters of vision, chapters 11 and 12. But when I'm through with you, I've got to go back and fight with this guy. And by the way, when I'm through with him, the prince of Greece shall come. You notice he speaks of Michael as a prince. So the term prince here, this translated prince, and is implied, what's implied here is an angelic rank. He's fighting some kind of angelic, and I don't mean in the good sense, I mean a super, some supernatural messenger that he calls a prince. First one he's fighting with is the prince of Persia the captain of the spiritual beings behind the Persian Empire at that time. But he also points out that after I'm through with him, i got another one to deal with, the Prince of Greece. And he's not talking about Alexander the Great. He's talking about the spiritual power behind that movement. It was 200 years between Cyrus and Alexander the Great. The Persian Empire was around a while. Then, of course, Alexander the Great rose to power, defeated the Persians, conquered the world, the known world all the way beyond India. As a young guy, not bad, interesting guy. Fascinating career, you should read it, read up on it, it's a fascinating guy. Point is, though, he's not talking about Alexander the Great, he's talking about the supernatural agency behind that. Right? That's all it said. I'm not here to build a theology on these hints. I'm just suggesting we stand back and listen to what the Scripture is saying that behind the reality that you and I observe is there's a supernatural battle going on. There are good guys and bad guys, and they are in contest. The victory is Jesus Christ's. No question about it. Don't be, have a doubt about that in your mind. But it's not a slam dunk in the sense it's all a done deal. The, the outcome is determined. But there is a warfare going on. Now, let's just make this part A. Let's go to part B. Changing the subject, but yet not changing the subject. I'd like you to turn with me to the book of Revelation. Now, I think most of you are familiar with the basic structure of the book. The book of Revelation is divided really into three sections. The first section is one chapter long. For you COBOL programmers, it's the data division. It defines 24 titles of Jesus Christ that are used through the rest of the book. Chapters 2 and 3 are the present Verse 19 of chapter 1 says, to, uh, John is instructed to write the things which thou hast seen, the things which are, and the things which shall come hereafter. Metatauta, after these things. The things which thou hast seen, the vision of chapter 1. The things which are, chapters 2 and 3, the seven letters, seven churches. From chapter 4 on to the end of the book are yet future. Those are the three main, not of equal size, but those are the three main sections of the book, as defined by verse 19 of chapter 1. And we've all been through that. Now, when you get to chapter 4, it's interesting, the lampstands that are introduced in chapter 1 that are detailed in chapter 2 and 3 representing the church are in heaven. There's lots of reasons why. They're not obvious unless you study the book carefully, but there's a lot of reasons why most of us believe that the rapture is implied in chapter 4, verse 1. But in any case, setting that argument aside, Chapter 4 on is future. 
And you know the story in chapter 5. There's a seven-sealed book that's presented. There's only one Abel that's qualified that has paid the price to take that on and open the seven seals, and he does, namely the Lion of the tribe of Judah, our Lord and Savior. He's taking possession of that which he bought some time ago. He paid for it on the cross. He's taken possession of it in chapter 5. Now, as he opens the seven seals, the first four are the famous horsemen, and there's a couple more. The seventh seal leads to a pause, and then seven trumpets. And then, of course, the seventh of the seventh trumpet leads to seven bowl judgments, so there's seven seven seals, seven trumpets, seven bowls. It becomes somewhat uh, a basic structure to the book. But what I want to focus on are the trumpet judgments. Chapter 8 has four of them. Chapter... After the first four trumpet judgments, the last three of the seven are known as the woe judgments. They are particularly heavy. In fact, the whole flavor of the book is almost a logarithmic projection uh, uh, projection or series. They get more and more intense as you go. But the one I want to focus on tonight, just uh, as another sort of glimpse, is chapter 9, which opens with what's called the fifth trumpet. Strange stuff, and it's not my intention this evening to go through a you know, complete dissecting of this. That's really a subject for another series. But I just want to remind you or expose you to some locusts that are mentioned in chapter 9. Chapter 9, verse 1, the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fall from heaven into the earth, unto the earth. And to him was given the key to the abuso, the bottomless pit. And he opened the bottomless pit, and there arose a smoke out of the pit like the smoke of a great furnace, And the sun and the air were darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit. And there came up out of the smoke locusts upon the earth. And unto them was given power, as the scorpions of the earth have power. That's going to be mentioned several times. They have power like the scorpions. What kind of power does a scorpion have? He stings, but I mean painful. And I'm glad I've only read about this. I have no experience with it, but I do understand from reading at a distance... (laughs) It's one of the most painful experiences you can experience as a human being. Some scorpions are really, really... Um, in fact, I, I, I think the pain is severe enough that in some people it causes death. And it was commanded them that they should not hurt the grass of the earth, neither any green thing nor any tree, but only those men who have not the seal of God in their foreheads. See, chapter 7 dealt with some sealing. I won't get into that here. But the point is, those that aren't sealed or protected are vulnerable to being hurt by these locusts. Now, we're already starting to get puzzled here because these locusts don't go after grass or green things or trees. That's what locusts usually do, don't they? So there's something... These are not locust locusts. These are... Locust is used idiomatically here, as we'll see in a minute. And to them it was given that they should not kill them, but that they should be tormented five months. Twice, by the way, it'll mention five months. And that's a little bizarre, too. Why five months? And the torment it was like the torment of a scorpion when he striketh a man. And in those days shall men seek death and shall not find it, and shall desire to die, and death shall flee from them. Wow. And by the way, I have no idea what verse 6 means. Men shall seek death and not find it? I have no idea what that means. The more I think about it, the more puzzled I get. Because in my naive... Uh, thought process here, if I wanted to destroy myself that badly, you know, I could wrap myself in some C4 or something, and, and uh, I can't visualize how, that, how I would escape death doing that. I could visualize jumping off a 100-story building and being injured badly. I mean, not dying. That's the, that's the fear that keeps you from jumping sometimes, because you're afraid you might not succeed. Yes, I know. I, I talk like the one who knows. Um, but it's you know in my mind uh, I would think and that means I obviously don't understand what this means. Is there be a way to? But this says no. It says the other. It says those days shall men seek death and shall not find it. So you draw your own conclusions. Let's move on. The shapes of the locusts were like the horses prepared in the battle, and on their heads uh, were, as it were, crowns like gold, and their faces were like the faces of men, and they had hair like the hair of women, and their teeth were like the teeth of lions, and they all had breastplates, as it were, breath, breastplates of iron, and the sound of their wings was like the sound of chariots of many horses running to battle. And indeed, some commentators visualize in their mind helicopters, you know, battle battle uh, weapons of some kind. I'm not sure that's what I see, but some do, and it's, it's, it is interesting, but that's not the point. 
They had tails like scorpions, and there were stings in their tails, and their power was to hurt men five months. Now, about this time, you're saying, gee, that sounds colorful, but I have no idea what's going on. Let me explain you have even less idea until you get verse 11. It says, they had a king over them, who is the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in the Hebrew tongue is Abaddon, and in the Greek tongue hath his name Apollyon. So one woe is past, and behold, there are two woes hereafter. So that's the first woe, or the fifth trumpet of the series. Now, you, you don't have to be a very profound reader here to recognize something really spooky is going on here. But the strange verse is verse 11, that they had a king over them. And who was the king? The angel of the bottomless pit, the angel of the, the, angel of the Abuso, who has names. The names are getting given here in two languages, Hebrew and Greek. Abaddon, Apollyon. Now, what makes this puzzling, and I'm, what I'm telling you now is very well-traveled ground. If you're a serious student of the book of Revelation, you all immediately remember Proverbs 30, verse 27, where the Bible tells you that the locusts have no king. The writer to Proverbs is making a different point. He says the locusts have no king, yet they can advance in ranks. And he's just making, he's making a, descript, a descriptive comment about locusts. But, see, if you have a high view of inspiration, if you really understand that this book, these 66 books by 40 authors written over thousands of years, is an engineered message system where every detail, every number, every place, every subtlety is there by design, you also have learned by now to recognize that the Holy Spirit tucks these little clues around. So if you put them together, you get an insight. And the first point is, that tells you that if the locusts have no king, these locusts do have a king. What does that tell you? That these aren't natural locusts. They are a demon host described in the idiom of locusts and what have you. Are we together so far? Okay. Let's turn to Ezekiel 38. We've talked a lot about Ezekiel 38. And the more you study this passage, the more vivid current events become to you. Will come to you. Chapter 38. The word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Set a man, set thy face against Gog, the land of Magog, the chief prince of Meshech and Tubal, and prophesy against him. And say, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I am against thee, O Gog, the chief prince of Meshech and Tubal. And on he goes. And we're, I think most of us in this study have been familiar with Ezekiel 38 and 39 for lots of reasons. Now, what's interesting is Magog is not a mystery. Some people try to make it one, but Magog is listed in Genesis 10 as one of the sons of Japheth, and he had his descendants. And the ancient records, Hesiod in the 8th century B.C., long, you know, uh, before this was written, um, Herodotus in the 5th century B.C. gives us a great amount of detail of Magog and his descendants. So does Philo. So does Flavius Josephus, or Josephus Flavius, actually, um, and so on. In fact, as I indicated, there's over a hundred specific ancient references that corroborate who Magog was. Magog was the ancestor to the Scythians. The Scythians were the, are the ancestors to the uh, true Russian. 110 ethnic minorities in the Soviet Union, and um, uh, the dominant one in the Russian Republic, which is, of course, the largest republic, is indeed the descendants of the Scythians. We know a lot about the Scythians because many of their tombs have been found in Siberia and elsewhere, that are frozen. So it's one of those rare opportunities where we find a tomb that's over 2,000, 3,000 years old in which there's skin and hair and there's material in the digestive tracts that can be analyzed scientifically. So they, can, they, lo- they know a lot about the lifestyles and personal habits of the Scythians. And these were a tough breed, as I think we all have talked about. They drank the blood of their enemies from their skull as a stein. They took the skin of their enemies and decorated their quivers. They were incredibly able militarily, primarily because they had developed horseback archery to a degree that's never been equaled since. There are many, many records from different authorities which corroborate the fact that they apparently had as a standard skill to bring down a bird in flight while riding at a full gallop with either hand. So they were tough guys. Their bows were incredibly tough draws. But that allowed them to use short-stroke arrows so they could get off ten arrows to one of their enemies. But the main thing was that they, they, were, they were really tough. And uh, um, 
Anyway, enough of the Scythians. Interesting guys. And uh, if you want to read about that, of course, we've told you more than you really want to know about Scythians in our little report called the Magog Factor. The point is, Magog is not a mystery. Some prophecy teachers try to make it one. It's not. The reference here is clearly Russia. Not because of Meshech and Tubal, by the way. Now, Meshech is, it looks like, it, the, the, the track record here is not quite as crisp or firm, but um, the Mushki were pe- people that ended up going north and gave their name, Muscovy, to the area in general and the city of Moscow later, and that uh, the uh, Tubal was actually further in the south, but the same people gave that name to the east ca- eastern capital, Tubals. But that's, that track, that, don't base your identity on that basis because that does have some uh, cloudiness to it. But Magog is no question about who Magog is. Now, what I wanted to focus on was Gog. Everybody glibly talks about Gog and Magog. He talks about the Bible in Ezekiel 38. Gog turns out to be a mystery because the name comes from nowhere. Gog just shows up. If you've been reading your Bible up to here, you haven't seen the word Gog. It's a bizarre name. Some people feel it's somehow derived from Magog, but that's conjecture. The word Gug in Sumerian means darkness, but that's of no real help. That's just sort of coloration, if you will. Um, And it's unlike the Bible to introduce an important name without a linkage, without being tied to something. Yet if you study Gog and Magog, uh, it's obvious that Gog is the leader of Magog. So many scholars haven't focused on this because from the context, and as you understand the passage, clearly Gog, whoever he is, is simply the leader of the land of Magog. And who's the land of Magog? The Russians. So who is Gog? Is it Khrushchev or Yeltsin or something? That's not the point. The point is he's the leader of Magog at this time. Now, there is, if you think about it, one another peculiar enigma. Because Gog and Magog show up again at the end of the millennium. You all know when the Lord comes back that the beast and the false prophet, these two characters that Satan has raised, go into the Abuso. Excuse me, not the, into Gehenna, into the, uh, the lake that burns with fire and brimstone. Satan does not go into Gehenna then. He is chained for a thousand years, huh? bound for a thousand years. And uh, and there's a perfect kingdom set up. The Lord Jesus reigns on the earth with a rod of iron for a thousand years. At the end of the thousand years, the millennium as it's called, Satan is loosed for a little while. God has an errand for him to run, to do some kind of a final test, if you will. But where that passage is mentioned in Revelation 20, you also notice that Gog and Magog surface again. Well, now, Magog's not a problem. That's a country. And so for it to survive for a thousand years is not surprising. But what's Gog doing there? Because if he's a leader, how did he survive a thousand and, you know, and because of those problems, some people try to place Ezekiel 38, 39 at the end of the millennium. But that doesn't work because it's obvious from the whole context it's pre-Messianic. In other words, the event, the Russian invasion, and God intervening on behalf of Israel is one of the preceding conditions to the Lord Jesus coming on the earth. You, follow, you see the problem. Well, it turns out there's an interesting discovery that I want to share with you tonight, and it's my belief that you won't find this. To the best of my knowledge, it's not in any of the commentaries. And as you can imagine, Hal Lindsey and I together have a considerable library on Ezekiel and on Revelation and these things. And in the commentaries, as best, and I may have had an oversight somewhere, but I have not been able to find it anywhere. But anyway, I want you to go with me now to Amos. After Daniel, Hosea, Hosea, Joel, Amos. Now, you know how to become an instant Bible expert. You take a tab and put it on the table of contents. And when I say Amos, you quickly look there and you know immediately it's on page 936. You can't be an expert without a Pharisee tab, right? Now, in your Bible, and I have no idea what Bible you're using, but I'm going, to, I'm going to conjecture that in your Bible, Amos chapter 7, which introduces a locust plague. Amos is fam- Joel mentions locusts as an idiom of devastation. And you can take that very literally as a literal swarm of locusts. And also he's using it idiomatically to speak of some other kinds of de- devastation. Amos also uses the phrase locusts 
In chapter 7, verse 1, the King James reads essentially like this, Thus hath the Lord God shown unto me, and behold, he formed grasshoppers in the beginning of the shooting up of the latter growth, and lo, it was the latter growth after the king's mowings. How many of your Bibles read essentially like that? In one way or another, NIV or whatever, okay. It's interesting that that's the way it reads in the Hebrew Bible. That's the way it reads in the English Bible. What's interesting to me, that's not the way it reads in the Septuagint. Now, you all remember that in 270 years plus before Christ was born, the Jewish world desired to have their scriptures in the common tongue, which was around the world at that time, thanks to Alexander the Great, Greek. So if you were a Jew living in that time, you know, say the third or more centuries, after Babylon, they came back speaking Aramaic, when, and then the Persians took over, a couple of centuries later, Alexander took over, and he enforced Greek as international language. So if you were a Jew, you spoke Greek. What Hebrew you knew was probably just ceremonial for your some rituals in the synagogue, but you didn't you generally didn't have fluency in Hebrew necessarily. Hebrew was to a Jew what Latin is to a Catholic, a language you might know for ceremonial purposes, but not be, being facile in it. So the Jewish community wanted to be able to read their, their uh, scriptures, the Old Testament, the Tanakh, in their own language, which was Greek. So 70 scholars were impaneled in Alexandria, one of the major centers at that time, and they spent 15 years translating the Hebrew scriptures into Greek. And the result of their work is the Septuagint, what we call the Septuagint version, sometimes abbreviated in Roman letters, LXX, meaning 70. Septuagint, just a fancy word meaning 70. And it may have been 72. I won't get into that quarrel right now. Some people weren't 70, it was 72. Well, that's okay, whatever. Um, now, the Septuagint version is an important translation of the Old Testament. In fact, the New Testament frequently quotes from the Septuagint, not the Hebrew. The book of Hebrews in the New Testament has its quotes from the Septuagint. We know that because there are subtle differences between some of the translations, so we can tell by studying that who they were quoting from. Do you follow me? And the Septuagint thus is in a very real sense sanctified by the Holy Spirit doesn't mean it's perfect. I just mean it's uh, obviously a non-trivial translation. You with me so far? Now, it turns out that uh, Amos chapter 7, verse 1 in the Septuagint really reads differently. Why? I have no idea. But let me tell you what the Septuagint says. In effect, the Lord hath shown me, and behold, a swarm of locusts were coming. And behold, one of the young devastating locusts was Gog the king. Isn't that wild? Yeah. Now, this is wild for lots of reasons. The first ad adjective aspect of this, it's, it blows me away to stumble into something, quite, frankly, quite by accident, that apparently has eluded the awareness of commentators for centuries. Why? I have no idea. Well, there's a couple of countries. And by the way, so that you uh, um, have a little bit of background on this, um, the Ralph's uh, version is where we first found this. The uh, standard Greek-English lexicon, which is a classic, is uh, the Gingrich and Danker, which uh, comments on this. And uh, uh, Hatch, Ed, uh, uh, Edwin Hatch and uh, Henry Redpath's a Concordance of the Septuagint and other Greek versions Make another point, by the way. They have four different texts that they lean on. The Codex Alexandricus, Codex uh, Vaticanus, and Sinaiticus. Where they have a variation, or where it's a weird one, they footnote it, call it a variant reading. That has escaped scholars for 1,900 years. I'm not saying it's likely. It's possible. It happens. I mean, unless you, you know, you, 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 presumably you've got to have some tools to get behind some of this. But the point is, it happens. And I, let me make a, a peripheral point here that I think is provocative. Most of us uh, in this room, I think, hold to a view that would be cataloged by those that must catalog things as, um, you know, the two kinds of people, those that catalog things in three categories and those that don't. But um, 
Most of us are, are, are what we'd call pre-tribulationists. What that really is intended to uh, imply is that we feel that the rapture of the church will happen prior to this very specific period called the Great Tribulation on the planet Earth. And we hold that view for lots of reasons, and that's not my motive. It's interesting that the adversaries to that view are so fond of pointing out that that's Darbyism, that that viewpoint emerged in the 1800s by J.N.D. Uh, you know, Darby. First of all, it's not true. The pre-tribulation viewpoint has a much earlier history, although they don't like to acknowledge that. But the real point is, so what? Are you saying that the classic church has been immune to error for 2,000 years? Hardly. You can go look back, and there's all kinds of things, anti-Semitism being a major aspect, where the church is guilty of all kinds of errors and heresies throughout its history. It's been a very imperfect uh, period of time. So the fact that there's some doctrine we're adhering to that comes from a... This is not annotated as a variant reading, which means all four of those texts agree. Isn't that interesting? So when no variant is mentioned, it may be understood that the four texts or such of them as contain the passage agree or that the variants are unimportant. No variant of Amos uh, 7.1 is mentioned. Okay, so the first thing, it's, it's strange that this should be overlooked. Now, what's the implications of it? Well, it's very obvious. Gog, oh, by the way, there's two words in the Septuagint for locusts. They're always used together for some reason. They usually co-occur. One is a normal a word for locust, and the other word is a particularly devastating locust. Both words are used. The, the lo, a, a, a swarm of locusts are coming. That's the regular word. But one of the young devastating locusts, the more intensive word used, is Gog the king. Now, again, this gives us all kinds of insight because, first of all, we now realize that what even Amos is talking about since, see, the locusts have no king, from Proverbs 30, 27, so the locust that Amos is talking about, while not as obvious as Revelation 9, is also an idiom used of a demon horde, right? Secondly, the king of this demon horde, here, and Magog, both are Gog. Is Gog, thus, a synonym for Satan? Not necessarily. Might be, or maybe it's simply one of his very senior lieutenants. In any case, we have now suddenly the passage in Ezekiel isn't as lonely. The word Gog there starts to link, not only to Revelation 9, Revelation 20, and so on. Do you follow me? So you're starting to build what I call, what we used to call in the agency, an association map. You can link these terms and, and start putting things together. It also starts to explain how Gog can show up at at the uh, time of the Ezekiel 38 battle and how he can also show up at the end of the millennium because he's not material. He's a demon king of some kind. Now, it also starts to show us what's really going to go on in Ezekiel 38. Yes, Magog and her allies are listed. The first one listed is Iran and then the rest of them listed. All Muslim, not an Arab among them. The Arabs on the sidelines, Shiva and Dida, are saying, hey, you shouldn't do that. They're just gainsaying. They're not fighting it nor helping. They're on the sidelines. So is apparently the United States, it would seem, except for 39.6, which suggests a nuclear exchange. But that's exciting. <laughs> okay, so we've had a little fun. Um, well, I like, maybe you might think I'm weird, but I think this is fun. I think it's fascinating, first of all, to realize that today, in your life, in your study, with a little bit of homework, there is a possibility that you will stumble into some insight that has escaped scholars for 1,900 years. I'm not saying it's likely. Possible. It happens. I mean, unless you, you know, you, 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 presumably you've got to have some tools to get behind some of this. But the point is, it happens. And I, let me make a, a peripheral point here that I think is provocative. Most of us uh, in this room, I think, hold to a view that would be cataloged by those that must catalog things as, um, you know, the two kinds of people, those that catalog things in three categories and those that don't. But um, <laughs> most of us are, are, are what we'd call pre-tribulationists. What that really is intended to uh, imply 
is that we feel that the rapture of the church will happen prior to this very specific period called the Great Tribulation on the planet Earth. And we hold that view for lots of reasons. And that's not my motive. It's interesting that the adversaries to that view are so fond of pointing out that that's Darbyism, that that viewpoint emerged in the 1800s by J.N.D., uh, you know, Darby. First of all, it's not true. The pre-tribulation viewpoint has a much earlier history, although they don't like to acknowledge that. But the real point is, suppo- so what? Are you saying that the classic church has been immune to error for 2,000 years? Hardly. You can go look back, and there's all kinds of things, anti-Semitism being a major aspect, where the church is guilty of all kinds of errors and heresies throughout its history. It's been a very imperfect uh, period of time. So the fact that there's some doctrine we're adhering to that comes from a more clear, recent insight in the Scripture is something that you don't need to apologize for. As an aside, don't fall into that trap because... Pre-tribulation. I believe Paul was pre-tribulation. I think you can, you can demonstrate it. But that's not the issue here tonight. It's interesting, though, to realize, as Daniel was told, that many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. And I personally don't believe that that has to do with knowledge in general. Many people quote that. I, I think I may have done it in my early tapes, too, in terms of the information explosion. Not that there is an information explosion, clearly. Half the scientists of the entire history of mankind are alive today. Did you realize that? We say scientists double every year. Well, the flip side of that same statistic is that means that half of them that were ever alive are alive today. You see what I'm saying? Because there's an explosion of knowledge and technology and the rest of it. But that's, I don't think, what Daniel's talking about or what the Holy Spirit through Daniel is talking about. Knowledge shall be in Christ about, about the Word. There are things that Daniel, it was told to seal up until the time of the end. The book of Revelation is in contrast to Daniel. Because John is told, seal not the book. You with me? There's an interesting contrast between the, ap- the apocalypse of the Old Testament and the apocalypse of the New. One was sealed, one is not. But it's also rather provocative for us to watch that day by day, within the biblical world, and I'm talking about the believing biblical world, not the ones with all the PhDs and stuff. I'm talking about people who really love the Lord and, and, and uh, have a humility before the throne of God. That today we're making discoveries. Discoveries that are verifiable, that are right in the text, that no one's noticed, and yet are very critical to really understanding what the text is saying. Are we together? Okay, we've had a little fun. We've talked about Daniel 2 and this hint, this murky glimpse of the spirit world that's behind the scenes in major governments. We took a quick glimpse at Revelation 9 to get a feeling for the idiom of locusts and the fact that they, if they have a king, we're talking demons, not grasshoppers. And we looked at Amos with the benefit of a slightly different insight. And right now, what you should be saying to yourself, Chuck, that's great, that's cute, what's it got to do with me? Right? How many felt that way? Be honest. Well, there's a few honest people. Okay. Um, There was a spirit organization behind the Persian Empire, right? Scripture says. There was a superseding supernatural power group behind the Greek Empire, right? It doesn't say so, but would you conjecture that there was a spiritual organization, army, whatever, behind the Roman Empire? that conquered the Greek Empire, right? Let me ask you a question. Is there a spiritual organization with a leader that this messenger would have called the Prince of the United States? That's kind of scary, isn't it? To stop and think that, you know, we see, we think of our country as our country, We think of our country as Washington, Bush, the Congress. I mean, we have all our mental images of our country. Most of us don't really stop to think of the United States in supernatural terms or that behind all of this are there's warfare going on. As we conjecture in this area, is there 
combat going on between now and November on the outcome of the election. Does God care? I suspect he'll care to the extent you pray about it. And I'm not here to to recommend one over another. I'd hate to have to try to do that with the turkeys that we've got running. (laughs) I mean, take your pick. You've got a a guy that was professional dissimulation guy, head of CIA on the one hand. You've got a confirmed adulterer on the other. Take your pick, what you like, you know. And we want to talk about faithfulness and fidelity to this country. I, anyway... But you do need to pray, and the, Lord, the Scripture instructs you to pray for this country. Because Second Chronicles 7.14 is still there. In fact, as long as I brought it up, let me just use the occasion to review it one more time. Turn with me to Second Chronicles. Chapter 7. Second Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14. If my people... I love that phrase. Are you the people of God? Now, the denotative use of this, of course, is Israel. But connotatively, it applies to us in these days. If my people, who are called by my name. How many of you are called by the name of God today? Praise God. Remember that when you behave yourself in traffic. Don't do what I do. (laughs) There are situations in which I reach into some very old vocabulary of mine that I'm ashamed of. Fortunately, it's getting less and less, so the Lord's working. But I'm still fascinated by my hostility towards inanimate objects. I, anyway. Um, if my people who are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray. Tough stuff. Humble yourself before the throne of God. And pray. And one more thing. And seek my face. And when you read that, I want you to remember Daniel 10. What caused the messenger to get through those 21 days of combat? Daniel was seeking the face of God. I'm not necessarily saying fasting, although that can be part of it. But he was obviously demonstrating he was serious about seeking the face of God. And the question you need to think about as you go home tonight, are you serious Are you really serious about your relationship with Jesus Christ? Are you really serious about seeking the face of God? If my people who are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. I believe that's not the hardest part of this. That may shock you. Because you say, gee, that's a tough part. No, I don't think so. I think it's the other way around. Because if you really are humbling yourselves, if you really are praying, if you really are seeking his face, you will turn from your wicked ways. They will be abhorrent to you as they are to him. Then, God says, will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. Okay. Let's talk a little more about application. How many of you noticed some changes in Los Angeles in the last week? And I want to watch my words very carefully because I had the benefit, if I can put it that way, of being away. I was traveling for part of that. So I didn't have the face-to-face confrontational atmosphere that you people endured during this terrible debacle. And I'm also not here to speak sociologically. Obviously, one can deal with the tensions and the trauma and the the agony of disadvantaged people of all shapes and sizes that go on in every major metropolitan area. And Los Angeles is the largest city in the world. It's the greater Los Angeles area. So there are all those issues, and I'm not a sociologist, and you all have better exposure and background than I have in that dimension. I'm not going to focus on that. I'm also not really focusing on the Rodney King bit, because I happen to personally hold the view that it was at most only a trigger, not the issue. 
To my understanding, there were three guys in the cars and the other two didn't have a problem, so they must have done what they were told. But the point is, that's not the issue in my mind. What is the issue, Chuck? Well, let's stand back and look at a few facts, and I am in the process of trying to get the documentation to prove the following things, whether they're really so. But here's my understanding. Prior to the riots, prior to the jury verdicts, there were pamphlets being distributed by the Muslim interests. There is a strange affinity between the disadvantaged Negroes and Islam. As a matter of fact, I was sharing this at dinner tonight, and I was reminded of an anecdote that I frankly had forgotten about for almost 20 years. And I'll just throw it in uh, for what it's worth. About, uh, I can't remember the exact year, it would have been the early 70s, Walter Martin was on the West Coast. As I think some of you know, my partner and I were the guys that brought him to the West Coast. In those days, he operated out of Wayne, New Jersey, Christian Research Institute, and we struck up a great friendship with him and did a number of things together which led to his getting, uh, just falling in love with Southern California and the support he got here. So we moved him out here to the West Coast, and, of course, he settled ultimately in San Juan Capistrano. And uh, most of you, if you haven't heard Walter Martin's tape, I think he's unexcelled on tape. He's one of the most articulate, fabulous human beings I've had the privilege of knowing. And uh, he passed away a few years ago, as you know. And uh, But a delightful guy and one of the greatest experts on comparative religions in America. What he used to do is come to the West Coast and do like a five, six, seven night stand. He had a couple of, and he'd talk about the cults of various kinds. And he used to, that was a specialty. And he used to talk about the Mormons, the Jehovah's Witnesses. He had a couple of standards that everybody always wanted to hear. Then he'd always tag on one or two of the more offbeat kinds of things. And it happened that he decided to undertake an expose of the black Muslims. Most of us in the paper and our exposure to them regard them simply as an activist group. Most of us do not, probably have not had uh, direct exposure to the theological side of the black Muslim doctrines. And that was Walter Specialty. And he had announced a series of meetings on various things. And one of the evenings it was at Melody Land Christian Center, which was a major uh, platform for him in those days. Um, he was going to speak about the black Muslims that night. And I can remember in my office, Walter was there, and the Anaheim police came. Now, in, you know, our office was in Newport Beach in those days, but they came, because they obviously had jurisdiction of Melliland, and they came to talk him out of speaking that night because they were convinced that there was going to be an assassination attempt. And, uh, and they, they pointed out all the reasons, they didn't give us all the reasons, but they made it clear that they are familiar with crank calls, and they were convinced this was not a crank call, there was a serious plot, to deal with Walter uh, during his talk that night. And they asked him to reschedule or not appear, and he refused. And it's in experiences like that that you really get the measure of the man. Walter um, refused to, to not speak. I mean, he insisted on speaking. Then they said, well, will you at least wear a vest? <laughs> you can hear him today. He says, Psalm 46 is my best. <laughs> he threw him out of the office. <laughs> and uh, we were involved because we always tape recorded Walter because we were trying to organize the tape ministry for him. And uh, Walter later told the story. Obviously nothing happened. He wasn't shot that night. But the point is, uh, he, Melody Land usually sectors its audience, but if it's a full house, they'll eliminate the sectors. And you have a 360-degree stage, as you know. And uh, Walter says he was doing fine until he got up on stage and he realized, first of all, you can't see the audience. The lights are so bright on the guy because of TV and stuff that you see just, you, you can't see the, you, you don't have eye contact, which is disturbing anyway. But he also realized that it's 360 degrees. So he had his back to somebody. And uh, he said it gave him some moments. But it, obviously, but obviously nothing happened. And... Um, but it's interesting, in the prelude to that, you've got a great insight into the man, a real warrior for the faith. But now I was just reminded about that at dinner night because I'd forgotten that the particular group that was the militant threat to Walter was a group identified as the black Muslims. And one of the things I'm going to suggest you do in coming months and so forth is keep your antenna up on not only that movement, because what it does, it feeds on 
injustice. Is there injustice? Of course. Are there problems? Serious ones. But one of the opportunities that creates is for these militant groups to get organized or try to get organized. I'm getting video authentication being sent to me. In fact, it's been sent to me. I haven't had time to review it yet. But it's my understanding that what it reveals is that in the areas that were burned, the, the, built, the, the businesses that were owned by Muslims were spared. Now, does this surprise us? It shouldn't. It shouldn't, for lots of reasons. Islam is on the move. There is a race going on among Muslim leaders. Saddam Hussein's rebuilding of Babylon was part of his attempt to be emerge as the leader of the Muslim world. And, of course, the Persian Gulf disturbed that, but not as much as we'd like. In fact, the, the whole handling of that becomes a bigger mystery the more you study it. Assad of Syria has his ambitions. Right now, one of the major contenders for leadership is Rafsanjani of Iran. He's the leader of the Shiites. I was fascinated by the LA Times recently. He had this whitewashed kind of article Sunday saying that everything's moderating and getting nicer in Iran. Of course it is while the Senate's debating the foreign aid policy. What's really going on? Rafsanjani has issued the order to eliminate Jerusalem. And he feels he's the leader to disconnect the New World Order from its previous dominance of the Judeo-Christian West. He's trying to organize an Islamic axis from Indonesia and the Pacific all the way to, uh, to Tunisia and uh, Algeria in the, in the West. Islam is on the rise. The more you study Islam, the more you need to penetrate through the bandini that is promoted in this country. Islam is not only anti-Jew or anti-Israel it's anti all non Islamics. The Jews first, the Christians next. Make no mistake about it. And on a militant warfare basis, not by proselytizing, that's just the first option. So when we notice in our own culture that the disadvantaged blacks seem to have to see an appeal in Islam. And I'm not here, I'm not expert enough to try to detail the reasons. There's probably, it's very complex. But they do. There's, no, there's a naturalness somehow. And the Islamics are not blind to that. They're exploiting it. And they will again. It's provocative that the names of the street gangs in certain parts of our city have the same names in Memphis, in Chicago, and elsewhere, that they're also gangs. Interesting. There is a, an aggressive attempt to organize the so-called gangs. And there's lots of reasons why that's to their advantage. There are funds being spended to train them to elude arrest, to be less conspicuous, to be smarter at the games they play. Part of that's drug money related, because the gangs are the low-cost channel of distribution for that kind of traffic. But as you watch L.A. in flames, as you watch the social unrest, as you watch these things take place, increase your sensitivity to the possibility that they are not spontaneous, they are organized. Watch the papers as they uncover more and more of the methodology for setting these fires, and that's not spontaneous riot stuff. That's the work of practiced Prepared professionals. So yes, there's a sociological issue here, and that's not my expertise or my orientation. There are better people to listen to in that dimension than Chuck Missler. But I do think that it's interesting to stand back one notch and put in perspective Daniel chapter 10. Put in perspective Revelation 9. Put in perspective, not only Amos 7.1, but the book of Joel and so forth, and recognize the reality that behind the anguish, the tragedies, the, the disasters, who's the author of those? 
Who's the author of that? Who's the one whose ambition is our destruction? Apollyon, Abaddon, or whatever. Now, this isn't very helpful in maybe dealing with the pragmatics of your neighbors and friends and people who have problems to to sweep up, clean up, repair. It doesn't maybe help us a lot to deal with the, the pragmatic social issues that are, in fact, a burden of the city. Every major city. But I think it's useful for us to keep in perspective what Elisha's servant had to be taught when he pushed the button and said, reveal codes. <laughs> because I think what you and I do need to understand, even though it may not be pragmatically helpful in terms of the day-to-day anguish that people are facing right now, but to keep in perspective of what's really going on, and it's a spiritual warfare. You want to help L.A.? You want to help these people who have been burned out through no fault of their own? Remember Second Chronicles 7.14. It's called healing the land. But one step larger, as you watch the papers and as you see the Islamic propaganda, as you see our liberal press try to whitewash the circumstances in the Middle East, do enough homework to see through the deadly myths of the Middle East. Hal Lindsey is in the process of finishing what I think is going to be one of his most important works he has ever done. The exact title may be a variation, but the essence of it will be it's going to be the deadly myths of the Middle East in the nuclear age. And what he's demonstrating and documenting thoroughly is that most of what the public believes about the Palestinians, the PLO, the Middle Eastern problem, are well-engineered, fabricated myths, and it's well-documented. Our State Department... Our government is predicating its policy on foundations of falsehood, not truth. And that needs to be out in the open. So you want to do enough homework. You want to keep sensitive to, the, to one of the major threats to world peace today. And that's not the, quote, Arab-Israeli conflict. If you travel internationally, you go to LAX to check in the international terminal, you go through security, it isn't because they fear an Israeli bomb. If you follow what I'm saying. And by the way, King David was not king of the Palestinians. So there's a whole issue here that you want to do your homework on because it's going to get timely. I believe that the major raison d'etre or rationale of the one world order that's coming will be that it is the only pragmatic answer to the nuclear proliferation. On the one hand, we can laugh at our Defense Department and our Congress for trying to dismantle our military at a time when we are in greater jeopardy today than we ever have been in our history. We can laugh at that on the one hand, except doubling or tripling the military doesn't solve the problem either. Who are you going to aim it at? There used to be a tension between two superpowers. How many people are building ICBMs today? Twenty-two. How many of them have nuclear capability? Eleven. It's a free-for-all. What do you do about that? No military expenditure possible protects you against the kind of turmoil that's forthcoming, especially since the bulk of those are Islamic and hate each other, let alone Israel and the West. I often am amused as I read the Jerusalem Post and watch Israeli politics. I feel I can understand what Moses meant. When he asked the Lord, he said, hey, it was your idea, not mine, to run these people, to rule these people. There's only one thing more bizarre than trying to understand Israeli politics, and that's to understand Arab politics. Or I should correction, let me, I fell into the trap again myself. Not Arab politics, Islamic politics. Remember, you can talk about Iran, Syria, Iraq, Turkey, Egypt, Algeria, Tunisia, Libya, and you haven't even mentioned an Arab yet. The press uses Arab and Middle East almost as synonyms, or, or what they really mean is Islam. But the Islamic lobby has done an excellent job at keeping their image clear, and yet it's the root glue that puts this all together. And I see, uh, highlight to you who the king of that group is. It's not Muhammad. 
It's a guy by the name of Gog. He's mentioned the name of 7-1 and elsewhere. You and I are in a spiritual warfare. The more relevant you become, the more you need to be held up in prayer, the more sensitive you need to be about the spiritual issues. And that also goes for the ministries that you see around you. Calvary Chapel. What a miracle on the planet Earth. Why? Lots of reasons, not the least of which is it has from the beginning and continually gets held up in prayer. Unseen warriors all over the landscape praying for Calvary Chapel. The Firefighters for Christ, shipping out 100,000 tapes every month to all over the world. I'm flabbergasted. I go into remote parts of the world and find conclaves of enthusiasts that have all the firefighters' tapes and have heard them for years. Why? Because they've been held up in prayer. It's a spiritual battle. Most of you in this room have been with me a long time. Some of you have been here for, how many of you have been with me more than five years? That's if you want to help the ministry, pray for us. A lot of, the Lord is really blessing, a lot of things are going right, and yet let's never lose sight day by day that you and I are engaged in a spiritual warfare. Every once in a while it becomes visible. You can stand out on a point and count three or four hundred fires or several thousand fires, if you're, depending on where you're standing, uh, in Los Angeles. And you begin to realize that that is not just a sociological problem. It's not just a law enforcement problem. It's not just an injustice of a jury problem. It goes much deeper than that. It's a symptom of something else going on. Will it happen again? You bet. Will it happen in a different form? Absolutely. Will the adversaries, your adversaries, organize themselves to take advantage of it? Absolutely. So it's a spiritual warfare. Let's stand for closing word of prayer. In the book of Acts, Philip was removed from a great revival, taken out into the desert where there was an Ethiopian treasurer. We always get the little pictures in the Sunday school book that he's in a chariot. Nonsense. There was a caravan. He was a treasurer of all the treasures of Ethiopia. So he wasn't running out there without a bodyguard and a whole entourage. It was a whole caravan. But Philip is told to join himself to that caravan. And the Ethiopian was reading from the book of Isaiah. And Philip says, hey, do you understand what you're reading? He says, how can I without a guide? And Philip goes up there and explains to him he gives them a tutorial on Isaiah 53. And the Ethiopian says, any reason I can't be baptized? So Philip baptizes him. Philip probably was wondering, why does the Lord have me here? I had thousands in this big revival. Things were going great. He's got me out in the desert with this one guy. But that one guy, apparently, is the root to the Christians in Ethiopia to this day. But one of the things I want to highlight is how could Philip be useful In that situation, answer, he'd done his homework. How many of you, don't give me a show of hands, this is private, but how many of you could have joined that chariot and explained to a genuine inquirer, or even a skeptic, say, what Isaiah 53 is all about? How it portrays, 800 years before the fact, the crucifixion of the Lord Jesus Christ, how it lays out the reasons and background for that more vividly than all of Paul's epistles put together. Could you do that? See, one of the things that's implied that we never think about is that Philip had prepared himself for his calling. You and I, whether we like it or not, are already engaged in a spiritual warfare, and it's going to get rough. You saw a taste of it this past week in visible terms. Perhaps the most traumatic ones are going to be less visible, but just as real. And you're in it if you are in the Lord's hands. Did they work the Lord over? You bet. Are you higher than he is? No way. Was he persecuted? So will you be. That's part of the game. 
That's part of the call. Are you equipped for it? Have you prepared yourself? Have you prepared your faith for combat? Have you prepared your spiritual tools for the challenges that are going to be ahead of you? Let's bow our hearts. Father in heaven, we praise you for who you are. We thank you, Father, that (laughs) there's nothing that you're doing that you haven't revealed beforehand to your servants, the prophets. And Father, we thank you that greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. We thank you, Father, for the victory that you've already achieved for us in Jesus Christ. We thank you, Father, for the cross and all that it means. We thank you, Father, that the destiny is sealed and not subject to question. And yet, Father, we also recognize some of the challenges that are before us. We come before you in the name of Jesus Christ and his authority. We ask you, to the ministry of your Holy Spirit, to increase in us an awareness of those challenges around us that you would have us deal with. Help us, Father, to be prepared in your word, to be armed for this combat. Help us, Father, to undertake diligent study of these things, that we might be effective servants of your kingdom. We ask you, Father, to help us discover that particular specialty, that particular ministry, that particular calling that you have for each of us in these days. That in all these things, we might be more responsive to your will in our lives, that we might be more equipped to assist the brethren, to edify the body, and to confront the forces of darkness, when you call us upon us to do so. In all these things, Father, we just commit ourselves afresh into your hands, asking you to help us grow in grace and knowledge of the Lion of the tribe of Judah, the Mashiach Nagid, our Lord and our Savior. In his name we pray. Amen.